Praise the Lord. Good morning again. Uh, I just want to ask you something. It's a very basic question, but you guys don't be puzzled by me asking this to you. Okay. When I talk about, when you talk about God, when I say God, G-O-D, right? What comes to mind? We all know, I mean, as believers being in church for so long, you know, we would have heard about different, different, the different facets of God, the different names of God. So when I say uh, the name of God, what comes to mind? What first comes to mind? We know he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. We used to sing that song uh, back when, it, when, when I was in my old church. Jehovah Jireh was the song we used to sing every time. We talked about tithes and offerings. How many of you all remember that? So, yeah, right? It's the God who provides, the God our provider. So what are the other names of God that you remember? Anyone online? Sorry, guys, I can't hear you. I can't see you. <laughs> but what about the rest of y'all? You can just type it in. It is King of kings and lord of lords. Okay, anyone else? Prince of peace. Prince of peace. Amen. Yes. Jehovah Rapha. Praise the Lord. The Lord our healer. Amen. There's Rose of Sharon. Praise God. Wow, that's so good. Anyone else? Jehovah of Judah. Yes, he's the lion and the lamb. We know a lot about the names of God, right? And when you talk about the names of God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord our sanctifier, and there are so many others. Jehovah, oh, there's another one, El, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Then there is the El Olam, the everlasting God. That's really cool because when I read it up, it says the God that cannot be rolled up like a carpet and packed away. The God who cannot be erased. The one who stays after everything is gone. That is the El Olam, the everlasting God, the eternal God. When we look at the names of God, it kind of tells us about the traits of God and the character of God, right? So, Today, what we are doing is just an extension of worship time, all right? So this is a little bit different. It's not your standard sermon of sorts, right? So bear with me on this one. And I pray this morning, even as we look at the Word of God, that the Spirit of God will speak to you. I've been going through uh, the names of God for some time. It's like an off and on thing, not, not because we forget God or anything like that, but you know, sometimes you spend certain periods in your life going through uh, the names of God and studying the names of God. It's just an exercise so that we can know Him better because when you understand God better, when you know about God, you will know Him as well. And when that comes together, I'm able to worship Him better I'm able to serve him better. I'm able to understand him better. So that's basically the objective. And even this morning, as we look at God, we will not just be covering, not so much covering the names of God, but the traits of God. And as we do that, I pray that the Spirit of God gives us all a fresh vision of our God. The reason for our existence, right? The one who sustains us, the one who strengthens us, the one who brought us into existence first and foremost, and the one who leads us on into the awesome destiny that he has prepared for us. Amen. So that is the God we are looking at. That's the God we worship. Amen. Amen. Don't have to be so somber one. Like Pastor Fergus was telling us earlier, hey guys, you know, just be chill. Uh, jangan, uh, okay. Don't be so uptight. Don't be so, you know, this is not a funeral service. We are celebrating God, right? So let's let's celebrate the God we serve, amen? Right. Maybe we are, we are still kind of like breaking out of our lack of sleep. <laughs> well, some of us too much of it. So let's just look to God in prayer this morning, right? Father, you are a good God. And we just thank you that you are our God. You are our creator. You are the one who is our life force. You are the one who gave us breath. You are the one who lends us that breath and strength. You are the one who sustains us. And this morning, even as we look at your word, from my mouth to the ears of my brothers and sisters, 
those that are here physically, as well as those who are connected with us online, and even, Lord, those who will be listening to the recorded sermon. Let that word be your word. You tweak it, Holy Spirit, so that it will meet every single person, including me, at the very point of our needs today, so that each one of us will catch a fresh glimpse of your glory. We bless you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay, I've got to just adjust myself. This is quite new. Okay. Praise the Lord. Wow, Basanya. God, he is the beginning and the end. Let's read together, all right? Let's read it with all our hearts. Those of you who are watching online, I know you're muted. Your screens are muted. Okay, just aligning myself. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's read it with all our hearts, all right? even here. Let's declare the word of God into the atmosphere of our homes, into the atmosphere of our lives, into the atmosphere of this service this morning. Amen? Bole? Can? Let's do it together. The first one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. And finally, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. Amen. You know, from Genesis to John to Revelation, you see that God is there throughout the Bible. God is the originator of all things. He is the source and sustainer of everything in existence. This is God. No one planned it for him. No one helped him. He did it all by himself. All right. In fact, there is an interesting verse in Hebrews 1, verse 3, uh, that says that God upholds all things together. I'm just paraphrasing it by the word of his power. Basically, everything that exists is held together by the Word of God. So sometimes, it always made me wonder when I, when I was much younger, when these fellows were trying to kill Jesus. See, the Word of God, Jesus is the Word of God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who was the Word? Who is the Word of God? Jesus, right? And these guys were trying to kill Jesus. They were trying to commit suicide. You thought of that? If they killed Jesus, they would have died. Because Hebrews 1.3 says that things, everything in existence in the material world as well as the spiritual world is held together by the immutable word of God. That simply means Jesus holds everything together. Have you even thought, have you thought of this? If the devil really did manage to kill Jesus, not possible at all, but hypothetically speaking, he would have committed suicide. He would have disintegrated because... Jesus is the power that holds everything together. He is the one that holds the whole universe together. Think about it. And when you talk about the end, the beginning and the end, in the book of Isaiah, we see that God, in Isaiah 40, right, God asks Israel uh, the question, who compares to him? Surely there is no one. There can be no one. There was no one. There is no one. And there can be no one. And God asked them uh, about the idols that they were worshipping, even as they went away from God and all that, asking them, you know, how could you even think that these idols could compare to him? And one of the things God mentions is he is the one who knows the end from the beginning. Because God stands outside the sphere of time and space as we know it, and he is in the present of every moment in that he knows everything. He knows every single thing that has happened, that is happening, and that is going to happen. That is why he is God. Think about this. When we go to God today, let's say, uh, confession, you know, we go to him for you know, confessing our sins to him this evening, or before we go to bed, right? Repenting and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this again. He knows that in the course of your life, the 100 years that you live, 120 years, you're going to repeat that sin again and again and again because he's able to see through that. 
entire timeline, yet out of his benevolence, he chooses to forgive you. Good, right? He's not dumb, you know. He's good, right? He's a good God. And when I saw that, it helped me to forgive others <laughs> more easily, right? You know, this is God. And when we study about him, we, we know who he is. It helps us to reverence God, to love him more, and to serve him more. What we are doing now is just preparing our hearts and asking the Holy Spirit, yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit to align us to make our lives, our lives are already altars of praise and worship. To remove whatever ashes you have on the altar and put new firewood today, right? So that's what we are doing this morning, all right? So the end from the beginning, the thing is this. There's a verse in Hebrew that says that Jesus is the author and perfecter, the developer, some versions say, and the finisher of our faith. When God talks about the end, the beginning and the end. The beginning would be the origin of that, that uh, life or that work or that mission or that initiative that God has begun, right? Now, when you talk about the end, it is that place of maturity where that life, that job, that project, that mission has reached its ultimate potential. Since God designed us, He is the only one who is able to bring us to that place of perfection, that place of completion, that place where each one of us hits our ultimate potential. All right? So praise the Lord. He is the beginning and the end. Next slide, please. Thank you. God, creator and craftsman. Let's read it again. Let's read the two verses on top together. All right? The first one, you are... Worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And where were you? God is asking Job, right? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God asks Job lots of questions. Basically, to kind of like just summarize the whole thing in a nutshell, most of us have read the story of Job. He, was, he went through untold suffering. The thing is, God simply asked him, you can't even figure out or understand physical matters. Don't even bother to go into spiritual matters. Because everything God was asking Job were physical matters to which Job had no answers. Right? But interestingly, God was the one who laid the foundations of the earth. He was the one who determined the measurement of the earth, the mountains, the seas. Remember, he will... And then in the verses that follow, from verse 8 onwards, 13, he asks, who drew out the lines and set boundaries for the seas, etc., etc. That is... So, no, so awesome. You, the thought itself is like, this is God. This is the God that we serve. And then, of course, in Revelation 4, 11, we see that he created all things. By his will, they exist and were created. There's another verse in the Bible which, you know, says everything was created for him and through him. It's in, it's in Romans, I believe, right? All things were created by him and for him. That is God. He is creator and he's craftsman. You see, Genesis 1.27, and then we, in, in Genesis 1.27, God made us in his image. That's one of the reasons why the devil hates man so much. Because each time he looks at a human being, he sees the reflection of his maker, the one who booted him out of heaven, right? And that's why he's out to mar the visage of God. God made us in his image. Psalm 139, 13 to 15. The psalmist talks about God having knit us together in our mother's wombs. He made us, you know, in a sense that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not just uh, make us out 
none of us are here by chance. No one, no human being was born by chance. Nothing was made by chance. God thought about us. It was, you see, not only did God create all things, he also crafted them, designed, shaped, and built them intentionally and purposefully as a master craftsman. Every one of us has got this redemptive and prophetic destiny that God has created for us. That itself is something for us to worship God. No one is an accident. Everyone has got a purpose. God did not design losers. God made winners. God created us to fulfill the good works that he has ordained for us even before the foundation of the world. And now that we are, we who are in Christ are connected to the Lord, right? how much more we are able to hear the voice of God, to know God, and to move towards what He has purposed for us. Amen? And that simply means that wherever you are in life, remember this, that God is able to recalibrate you to His original design. He's able to realign you to His Word, to bring you back to the point where you need to be, to put you back on course. This morning, I'm just here to remind you. I'm also reminding myself as much as I'm sharing this with you guys. I'm speaking to myself too, right? Praise the Lord. Let's move on. The beginning and the end, God created craftsmen and God, it's, he's the sustainer. He's benevolent. Let's read this together. I put it, yep. The one who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Isaiah 40, 26. And then verse 12. He who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with the span of the hand and calculated the dust of the earth with a measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or has taught him as his counselor? With whom did he consult and who enlightened him? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? You know, as, as I shared when you were looking at the first slide, if God did not sustain the universe, it would collapse. Our very existence is totally contingent or dependent on his benevolence. You know something? Even as we are sitting here, not moving, right? I, I know you're moving, breathing and all that. The thing is this. Do you know that the earth is traveling at, I think, 186,000 miles, right? Per second, something like that. The earth is traveling. It's like you, you are on spaceship Earth and it is traveling, all right? And it has not crashed onto any asteroid or onto another planet. It has not gone off axis. That itself gives us reason to thank God, right? Amen. But we don't even think about it. <laughs> now, I didn't, I didn't until a few years back when I, when, I, when I checked this out and I thought, wow, God, you know. And then when you look at the air that we breathe, I mean, we can't see the air, but we breathe the air. What I'm saying is, you know, when you consider the air that we breathe, right, every component in the air is perfect for you to breathe, to be alive, to grow. There's no the wrong component mixture where you suddenly end up choking and dying. All these things, or God doesn't turn off the oxygen switch some over your life suddenly, or send you a bill at the end of the month for how much ox oxygen you have consumed, <laughs> right? He is benevolent, he is good, he is kind. He makes it rain on the evil and the good. He sustains us. Not only did he make us, but he sustains us. This is the God that we serve. You know, this is very interesting. Isaiah 40, 26. I was listening to a couple of Christian apologists who are scientists. who are talking about, you know, we all have read in our, our, our science books and, and, you know, and books on astronomy about the stars just burning off and just going, becoming nothing, right? And when they consider some of the stars that we are seeing, some of them say that the stars, you know, for, for, for the time, you know, for the stars to 
come to us, that, that light to come and travel through space, traveling a billion light years, billions of light years to where we are. Perhaps the stars that you see every night could have already burnt out, right? But there was this Christian scientist, I think it was John Lennox, who said that the word of God refutes it. Because he said, not one is missing. So, interesting, right? Interesting. Because that, that, that he, he, he deemed that a theory. And he said, this is the word of God. So, I'll just leave that to you to consider, all right? Because all the while, when we were studying science in school, we figured, hey, some of the stars you see at night really don't exist. You know? In present time, what you're seeing actually is something that's shown billions of light years away, and that light is traveling to you. And that's what you're seeing. But Isaiah 40, 26 says, not one is missing. <laughs> Go think about it. Food for thought, right? The next thing is this. See, he measures the waters in the hollow of his hand. I was reading one commentator. It was Tremper Longman, if I'm not mistaken. He says that God is able to hold all the water that exists in the power of his hand. And then, marked off the heavens with a span of the hand. Thumb to pinky, right? So everything that exists fits into the span of God's hand. Awesome, right? You even think of it. That is the God that we serve. And yet he cares about us. I know some friends, even we pray for car parks when you go into some complexes and we say, God, help us. We get a car park. How many of you pray for car parks? Don't lie, don't lie, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless you don't drive or take public transport, lah. okay, it's okay, it's no problem. But we all do that sometimes. And yet God cares about even the minute things that pertain to us, even the smallest things that happen to us. Because He is our Father. He is a benevolent God. He is a good God. And He cares about you and I. That is the reason why He sent Jesus. We just celebrated, I mean, Good Friday and, and Easter some months back, right? And we're looking at the work of Jesus on the cross, the completed work so that we can have this unhindered, inhibit, uninhibited relationship with God. He gave, you know, he just de uh, demonstrated his love for us. Even when we were his enemies, he sent Jesus to die for us. That is the awesome God that we serve. Amen. And so he is the benevolent sustainer. Without God, we would just blow up. We'll just disintegrate. He's the one who created us with a specific destiny for each one of us. And then there's another part of the destiny where there's a corporate destiny for the people that come together at different seasons that God brings together to fulfill a certain purpose for their lives as well as the community and for the nation, the church that they're connected to, right? And he brings everything he begins to maturity and fulfillment, to its maximum potential. That's what God does. As long as we keep our eyes on Him, we walk in obedience with the Lord. That is the God we serve. Wow, this sounds like a prayer altar already. All right. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Incomparable, indescribable. Isaiah 40, verse 18. Let's read the scriptures together. To whom then? Will you liken God? Or with what likeness will you compare him? To whom then will you compare me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become tired or grow weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who has no might, he increases power. Even youths grow weary and tired. And vigorous young men stumble badly, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in Him, will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles rising toward the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. The incomparable, indescribable God, that is what our God is. He is unknowable, yet knowable. 
because we know him through Jesus. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus reveals us to him. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. As we worship Jesus, as we read the Word of God, as we spend time in the presence of God, we know the Lord. We come to know and see different facets of Him, right? And that is how we know the Father. Because when you know Jesus, you know the Father. We all know that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. When you have come into contact with Jesus, you have come into contact with the Father. And, you know, there are so many attributes of the Father. I mean, can you imagine the angels and the elders in heaven, the cherubim, and the seraphim, all these guys, I mean, day and night, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, right? To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever. They are, they've been singing it from the beginning of time or even before that, right? From the time they were created right till now and they'll be continuing to sing it. Sometimes when we come to church, we can't even handle a 30-minute worship service. I'm not talking about this church, please, right? I'm not talking about we, any of us. But I was just thinking about it. As, wow, God, you know, God is so fascinating, so amazing, so awesome that as we come to know him, as you sit in his presence, there are so many things about God, so many different facets of God that we see every time. I mean, I'll just give you this example. Every time you read the word of God, you may be reading that same passage of scripture over and over again, right? But there are times where you see different things. The Spirit of God brings different things to your mind. And sometimes these things just jump out of the page. It may not be that particular facet of perspective that you always saw. It could be something new that God brings. And every time God brings that, I will testify to you that it always met me at the point of my need. I needed something and, and, and there was something happening in my life and God was speaking to me through his word. God's word is alive. That's why Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The present, continuous, active, dynamic word. It's not something that's archaic, that is for another time. That's why Ruben Achatori said that because God's word is timeless, it is always timely. That is so true. Amen. That is so true. God is incomparable, indescribable, I think. Uh, Pastor Chu was preaching once and he said, Tiada tandingan, tiada bandingan. So that is so true. God is indeed, Tiada tandingan, tiada bandingan. He is indescribable. He is incomparable. My whole, uh, the title of what I'm preaching today, what I'm sharing today rather with you is incomparable. This is the God we serve. This is the God we love. This is the God who loves us so much more than anyone or anything else. And the God who wishes and who wills for us to reach our maximum potential. This is God. Amen. Let's look at some attributes of God. God is good. God is light. God is life. God is faithful. God is true. God is king. God is judge. God is holy. All in all, when I checked, there were in my uh, concordance, the Logos gave me 238 <laughs> on the first level. If I continued, I would have found so much more. So I think this is, you know, God is, you know, if we put all our lifetimes together and we preached, right, or you put the lifetimes of everyone existed on earth, and we talked about the facets of God, we could still not finish it. We wouldn't even have touched maybe 1% of it. That's, that's, that's how awesome God is. Amen. That is how awesome God is. Let's just read this together. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see what that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. For Yahweh is our judge. Yahweh is our lawgiver. Yahweh is our king. He will save us. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. When King Uzziah died, I saw in a vision the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his royal robe, filling the most holy part of the temple. Above him, seraphim, heavenly beings stood. 
Each one had six wings. With two wings, he covered his face. With two wings, he covered his feet. And with two wings, he flew. And one called out to another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen. See, at the end, I mean, when you look at the names of God, the name with which God introduced himself to Moses is his most personal name, according to commentators. And that name is Yahweh. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. You know, it, it is so holy that the writers of scripture, those, those guys, who, the scribes who copied the, the scripture, had to break the, the quill, the writing implement they wrote. Each time they wrote YHWH or whatever they wrote there, right? They had to break it. And then use a new one. That much of reverence they had. They had to wash their hands before they started a new line. It's like, it may not make sense to us. We might find it so weird, right? What race stage? But it was their way, their means to attribute reverence to God, to honor God. And it's, it's, it may be strange to us, but the gist of it is they really reverence God. God is that holy, that set apart, that high above, that he deserves that worship. He deserves that reverence, that adoration, that honor. Referred to in the OT, Yahweh, over 6,800 times, often rendered as Jehovah or Adonai, uh, basically, uh, uh, it is a name that speaks of personality, the personality of God, the relationship that he has with the people of Israel to his sons and daughters today, the covenant that he has, and it is something that stretches for eternity. When God comes into a covenant with you, it is an eternal covenant. When God come, comes into a relationship with you, he does not call you his son and daughter today and tomorrow dump you. You are his son and daughter for all eternity. God does not abandon you. God does not forsake you. That's why Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when you read, you know, in, even in the Old Testament, you read what God spoke to the people, children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy and in Joshua, especially in the first chapter, he said, be strong and of good courage, right? So the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He said he will not leave. That ever abiding presence of God will not leave you. That is God who is faithful. That is the God who is constant, consistent. The God who is benevolent. He is good. We all know that he is good. How many of you have not tasted the goodness of God? Never tasted God's goodness here? Okay, praise the Lord. Because we will be surely praying for you afterwards. <laughs> He is judge, he's lawgiver, he's our king. He is a good, awesome God. This is where the first mention of Yahweh in the Bible comes about in Exodus 6, 2-3. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. You know, when you read uh, Psalm 23, we all know the Lord is my shepherd, right? That Lord, the Lord, is Yahweh. Yahweh is our shepherd. Yahweh is our healer. Yahweh is our provider, our protector, our sanctifier. He is our righteousness. He is the one who is always with us. He is our peace. P-E-A-C-E, -E, not P-I-E-C-E. -E. I just wanted to, <laughs> right? And he is the one who holds us together by the word of his power. This is God. This is him, right? Next slide. Daniel 11, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, the second part in the New King James Version says that the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people who know their God, not know about only, but the people who know their God. Okay, Daniel 11, verse 32, B, the second part of it in the New King James Version. I think that's rendered so accurately. The knowledge of God defines our life's trajectory, where we are headed. The heading of your life and my life is defined by our knowledge and understanding of God. 
it also defines our destiny. When you read the Word of God, when you understand who He is, when you understand the character of God, actually the whole world has been transformed by the people of God grasping who God is and understanding His character. The missionaries understood God to be a God of love. When you look, up, look at OA work, missions, or even going out to bring the gospel to others, we are bringing the love of God. We are sharing with them about a God who saves, a God who heals, a God who delivers. If we did not understand that benevolence, that love of God, no one will be going out doing missions. No one will be starting a church. If we did not understand the character of God, a community where God is boss, where God reigns, where God's presence permeates the lives of the people would never come into existence. We would be doing our own thing, right? We would not be in a community that encourages, builds up, that strengthens and reflects God, that releases the presence of Jesus. You must understand the character of God and you must have a revelation of God's love. Uh, we were ministering to people some, you know, who had issues with their parents, coming from broken homes, broken families, and all that. If we, who were ministering, did not have an understanding and a revelation of the fatherhood of God, how could we minister to them? We would have just moved on and just uh, you know, let them pick up the pieces or whatever. right? When you understand the character of God, you are able to bring that transformative change. You are able to Experience that transformative change for yourselves first. And you're able to bring that transformative change into the atmosphere of your life. You can't love someone without experiencing the love of God, correct? You can only love someone when you know that God is love. You cannot forgive someone before you receive the forgiveness of God. If you've understood the forgiveness of God. Right? And Jesus' standards are pretty high, right? Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. Not pray for them to die or anything like that. Pray that God would bless them, right? Because praying for them is easy. You could pray that God will kill them or something like that. But he's asking you to pray for them, to bless them, to prosper. Yes, Pastor Felix, to pray for them to prosper. That's tough, right? If you do not have the love of God in you, if you're not experienced that life of God, that forgiveness of God, revelation of God's justice. I've read about so many Christian organizations that go out and minister to uh, people who have been sold into, you know, child slavery, you know, child prostitutes, and 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 lots of things. Where people have been just kidnapped and 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 sold off into real hellish lives on earth, right? And these guys, when they came together, different people from different nations, different uh, professions, after reading the word of God, believers who saw the justice of God, they came together and formed, uh, you know, communities and, and, and organizations that buy these fellows out of slavery, that reach out to rescue them. When you talk about mission schools, I'm from... Uh, I'm a product of a mission school also myself. How many of you all went to mission school? Methodist Boys School, MBS, myself. You know, a lot of us, right? It's because those guys saw that need. They saw the love of God. And they brought that. They saw the character of God with regards to bringing up communities and people. And that's how they came in to minister, right? So the revelation of God's character in the lives of people is responsible for upgrading the lives of the whole world, practically. Wherever you see some good happening, it is because someone or, a, a, or, or, or you know, an, an individual or a community has grasped that revelation of God's character. And you are seeing that revelation of God's character manifested in that place. We are here in Sunai Bolo. Let us Get deeper into God so that we are able to release that character of God. A lot of times we talk about theology being very theoretical. Actually, theology is not theoretical. Theology is the knowledge of God, understanding God, right? 
And theology is to be lived out, not to be just read and allowing your head to become so big that it explodes. No, it does not. It is what we live out, what we bring in and what we live out. Amen. Only three fellas agree, Pastor Fergus and fellas at the back. Amen. Okay, you're awake. Praise God. Right. The final slide. Okay. There's a book I read some years ago that said, Everybody is a theologian. Remember that book? Everybody is a theologian. The truth is, everyone is called to be a theologian. Because theologians are worshippers. Theologians are people who know God, who understand God, who continue to grow in the knowledge of God. And the ultimate result of the knowledge of God is worshipping God. Coming into that place of praise, coming into that place of prayer, coming into that place of worship. This morning, we sang and worshipped God. Every one of the songs talked about the greatness of God, who He is, what He has done in our lives, what He is doing in our lives. In a sense... Knowing the character of God enhances our lives. You know, the, the, the most uh, revealing area should be that area of worship. It equips us to worship Him. It equips us to worship Him more. So that our lives itself will become living, breathing altars of worship to the Lord. Because when you worship God, God is in, and praise the Lord, right? God is enthroned on your praises and your worship. And his presence comes and dwells in your life. So wherever you are traveling, wherever you are going, you are carrying his presence and you are releasing Jesus into the atmosphere of that place. In a sense, our theology must consistently and joyfully lead us to God, not away from God, to worship and adore him. But that is our highest honor and privilege, worshiping God. And this morning, you know, We saw that God is the beginning. God God has initiated things. He's brought us into existence and he's leading us to the destiny that he wants us to fulfill. He's leading us to that destination for each one of us in, as individuals, as families, as a church, as a community, amen, and even as a nation and nations, right? We know that he's the one who initiated it. No one shared in the planning. He's the one who planned it. He brought us forth intentionally, consciously, right? And he's strengthening us, sustaining us. He's providing the means for us to reach that place. Amen. It's all about God. It's all through him. Even as the, the, the word of God says, it is all in him. It is all for him. It is from him and to him. Amen. And it's through him. Ultimately, when we see the different facets of God, the different attributes of God, it causes us to live out the life he has ordained for us to be reflectors of his presence. And knowing the character of God enhances our lives to come into that place of worship. I just want us to just get to our feet after this to worship the Lord with me, all right? I finished at 11, I think. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time. We are going to spend a bit of time worshiping the Lord. All right. No rush, no hurry. Worship the Lord. All right. And I want you to just think about what we uh, heard this morning, even if it is the smallest thing. All right. If you grasp the whole thing, praise God. But if it's one facet of God, I want you to worship God. I just want you to imagine that it is just you and God in this place. I want you to connect with the Lord. Even those of us who are online, wherever you are seated, standing, whatever, I want you to connect with the Lord. As we sing this song, How Great is Our God. Let Him be sovereign, supreme, and the most, you know, the preeminent one in your life, in your family, in our church, all right? And I promise you this, we will see change this day forward in our lives that we never saw before. That was what, you know, uh, I've been really, there were so many things that, so many ways I packaged this, this sermon and actually, in the end, it all went out the window. And I think God just wanted me to just share with you guys about who he is. And this God, 
He loves you and I so much. He's our father. I'll just share this quick story with you. Whatever you're going through tonight, I mean, this, this, this morning, right? Oh, definitely morning, yeah. Whatever you're going through, I just want you to remember this. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Many years ago, I've shared this story before. I just want to share this to you again. I went fishing with my dad. I was about nine, nine, years, nine or ten years old. Nine years old, actually. Went fishing with my dad. My dad used to, you know, take me fishing in these fishing boats, these large fishing boats. He used to go to pull out Tioman, pull out Rawa, pull out, pull out from Mangale and do fishing. So on one of those trips, I was sitting in this boat. My dad was there, two, his two friends and the boatman. And we were just, you know, the boat just drifted off. And everyone was busy catching, uh, you know, throwing in their, their, their rods and catching. They were catching this uh, ikan tangiri, Spanish mackerel. And, 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 and there was this large school of them in that particular location. And they were reeling these fellas up. And it was bright and sunny. But just in a matter of moments, it just became super dark. And I could see the waves. It just became black. That sea that's so green, right? Aquamarine color, right? It just became dark black. Dark blue, blackish kind of a thing. And I could see the waves. They were bigger. I mean, they were higher than the ship. I mean, the boat we were on, you know, it's not a ship, it's a boat. It's quite a long boat, though. The, uh, and, and it's so much higher. And I was like, I, I was just holding on to the side of the boat. I was just looking at it for a while. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this thing could just sink us in a matter of seconds if it hit us. My dad just came up to me, tapped me, and said, boy, just keep your eyes on me. Just look at me. You'll get to the shore, but you don't look at the shore or to that, uh, the waves there. Keep your eyes on me. The matter of moments, we are back on the shore. And I remember this. Uh, I was praying for someone many years down the road. My dad went to be with the Lord. I mean, he's gone to be with the Lord. I think uh, uh, he went to be with the Lord in the, in the year 2000. And this is like 20, 22 years, right? And I was praying for someone many years after that. And, and he was going through all these things and this, but God just reminded me, tell him to keep his eyes on me. And I'm here to remind you, whatever you are going through today, keep your eyes on the Father. And you, you will reach the destination that he has planned for you. Don't keep your eyes on whatever you think is safe. Don't keep your eyes on your trouble. Keep your eyes on the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just want you to lift your hands to the Lord. Even as we are standing in the presence of the Lord, Jesus is here in our midst. The Spirit of God is here ministering to us, bringing change and touching us, bringing healing and restoration, strengthening and encouraging us. Father, we just thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you are a benevolent God. We thank you that you are the reason for our existence. We thank you for your goodness in our life so far, God. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself. I pray for every single one of us here. I pray for SIBKL at Sunai Bolo. Your church, your sons and daughters. Your family, God. That you cause us to be theologians in the sense that we know you. We seek to know you more. That you will be our ultimate, foremost, and supreme pursuit. As a church, as a community, as, a fa as families, as individuals, God. And we mark this day, Lord, the 15th of May, 2022. And this day, God, you pour out your presence in a fresh new way upon us. You open the eyes of our hearts to see the work that you're doing. To know the length and height and depth, even the breadth of what you have done for us, Father. The love that you have bestowed upon us. That we would be the church, the people that knows our God. We would be the people that knows our God. People that would do exploits. We bless you. We worship you. 
Father, in this place this morning, magnify your name. Magnify Jesus. Magnify Jesus. Now, church, I'm just going to conclude with the benediction. But before I do that, I just want you to catch what God is doing here in our midst. Even as you take it throughout the week and throughout the rest of your lives, let that magnitude of the presence of God keep increasing. That magnitude of the presence of the Father increase in your life. So that we would be His ambassadors on earth. Wherever we go, wherever He sends us, remember that it is not by chance, it is only by His divine design and purpose. If you have a need, if you need prayer after this, the prayer team, the, el- the leaders of the church will be praying for you. If you're online, you can just reach out to the prayer team online. Just type pray and the prayer team will reach out to you. Even online, prayer is private. They'll put you in a breakout room and one or two persons will reach out to minister to you. But here, we will pray for you after the service. If you need prayer, you can just go to the back this of the church where the white board is and our prayer people our leaders will reach out to minister to you father you are good we just thank you for your presence in our midst we thank you for your word that lord today this word was sown on lives that are fertile ground that will bring forth a hundredfold harvest And Lord, our theology, our knowledge of you will help us to understand your character and to reflect that character in our lives. To release your presence, to release Jesus everywhere we go. We thank you, God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and bless you. It is shalom. That is his favor and his ever abiding presence. In Jesus name. Amen.